morning, everyone. Good morning, honored guests, the HMA team, my team, all of you. You look beautiful. Good morning. OK, now everybody smile. Excellent. I have quite the collection. So it is my pleasure to join you this morning to talk about some futuristic kinds of concepts, not so futuristic, really, when we think about it, in terms of what's happening in healthcare. So I've got a 15-minute slot. And I know I need to stay on topic, so we're going to get started right away. Uh, I always like to start with a, just a short briefing about JCI. Most of you know us. We're a not-for-profit based in the United States, and our mission is patient safety and quality. This is our global footprint. We have offices in different parts of the world. But the big news we have to report in 2018 is we're approaching our 1,000th accredited organization. And that's a big milestone for us. Next year is our 20th anniversary. And I'm proud to report that we now have at least one JCI organization in 70 countries around the world. So that's a new record for us. And thank you to our team. This is our profile in Asia Pacific. This is Thailand specifically. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. These slides will be available. Uh, but these are the statistics. And Asia Pacific is the fastest growing region for JCI right now. Um, in particular, number one country is China. Number two is Thailand. Uh, a lot of hospitals. But we're seeing also what this slide will tell you, a lot of growth in certifications as well as in ambulatory care. So that's the JCI update. But my purpose today, in terms of speaking to you, is to talk about the whole hospital construction industry. And specifically, really, what I'm looking at and what I want to talk to you about today is, are we building correctly for the future? So you know the big trends. I don't really need to talk too much about these. Demographics have already been referenced. As a globe, we are growing older. Today, we have about 900 people, 900 million people that are over the age of 60. But that number is going to go to 2 billion by 2050. The pace of growth for older people is growing much faster than it's been for the last 20 years. And when we have older populations, we see an increase in chronic disease. And chronic disease is part of the reason why healthcare is so expensive for all countries. But it's very interesting when we look at these numbers to understand that um, it's a very small group of people that drive the majority of the expenses. About 5% of the patients uh, drive about 50% of the costs. So really, our challenge from a cost perspective is to figure out how to deliver care to people with chronic disease in a way that helps re them be healthier people, but also reducing the costs. Because healthcare expense is a s really one of the biggest issues for everyone. This is an interesting fact, I think. It's today, around the globe, about 10% of the global GDP is spent on healthcare. In the United States, it's more than 18%. We're almost double the global footprint of uh, health expenses again, uh, compared to GDP. Now, when we look at the 10% too, we also have to remember that's the whole globe. When we look at individual countries, some are much, much lower than that, and others like the US are higher than that. But we know that all public sector uh, governments and ministries of health are challenged by the cost of health care. So they are very driven to understand better how to change the delivery system to be more efficient and more effective in patient care. And private sector organizations, as we're seeing here in Thailand, have a role in that as well. Uh, payers, which include governments, which include insurance companies, uh, they're looking for something new. And there's a very interesting experience, uh, experiment going on in the United States today where Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, a financial firm, J.P. Morgan and Chase, a bank, uh, they are forming a brand new company. And the purpose of the brand new company is to provide health care to the million employees of these three organizations in a more cost-effective and health-effective manner. Now, it's just getting started, and it's only a million people, which is not really that big a pool. But they're definitely going to be looking at how the healthcare is delivered in order to reduce costs. Technology, another big trend, and I'm not going to spend too much time. Last year, if you were here, we did speak, talk about this. But all of these, uh, all of these elements of technology, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, predictive analytics, all of that begin to create a new tool, 
a new toolkit for uh, health healthcare professionals to better understand what is going on in healthcare and better be able to serve patients in a way that's different than we have in the past. And we need to leverage that a lot more. We're not, I don't have really enough time today to talk about the healthcare workforce, but we continue to be challenged in this regard that there just aren't enough nurses, doctors, other kinds of technicians. And this is an interesting factor when you talk about should we build more hospitals? Because building the hospital is the easy part. Staffing the hospital is the big challenge. And I frequently visit brand new beautiful hospitals that aren't open yet because there's not any staff to actually manage the beds and provide the services. So tech, demographics, money, technology, workforce needs, all of these mega trends, as I see them, indicate that we are really ripe for a major change in our delivery system and how we deliver the care. And we have to move from what is a 20th century model to a 21st century model. And in this regard, what we're really thinking about now it's how do we, the providers, begin to connect more with patients proactively as opposed to reactively. Our delivery model, I think we could say, is somewhat obsolete, uh, in need of a change, and I think we can look to other industries for some help in figuring out what that looks like. So one of the things that I've been reading about, and you may have seen as well, is some of the big stores that we have all grown up with and used throughout our lives are starting to change. If you look at Marks and Spencer, Macy's, Sears, these are retail organizations that are kind of past prime. They've been slow to react to the digital environment. Um, they're seeing a decline in their sales. They're closing stores that have very weak financial performance. But some retailers are doing well. And one that, that is doing particularly well in the United States is Target. Now, I'm not sure there's a Target in Thailand yet, but they are quite a bit in North America. And they're having a very good year. Their first quarter traffic to the store has increased substantially. They are really seeing an increase in their digital sales. And they are going to open seven new stores in 2018. So very different than the other ones. So what can we learn from Target? Why are they thriving? Because they're changing their business model. They're keeping up with what the customer wants. If you order online, you can pick the stuff, the materials up at the store. They're making the stores more attractive. They are reaching out and meeting what the customer needs are. This is what we can learn from retail. We are still in a model that waits for the patient to come to the hospital, as opposed to being a proactive player, reaching out to, uh, uh, out to patients in the community to, get to, make, to make sure they get the care that they need. And this is particularly important for chronically ill patients. A hospital-based delivery model is not optimal for cr chronically ill people. It's, we need to be a proactive force in preventive care, in monitoring the conditions of the patients, of understanding what's happening to them on a day-to-day -day basis to really be able to help them in terms of their health care, the quality of the care, and the cost of the care. So we need to change our ways. We need to be more like Target and less like we've been historically, where the hospital has been the hub of everything. That's not true anymore. So some of the things that we're seeing in the United States um, in, the, in the hospitals in the states where, over the last decade, hospital utilization has dropped by almost 7%. Our lengths of stay are down, and just our, our just complete uh, utilization is very much in a negative way, a negative uh, trend. A lot of hospitals are closing. So it's changing very rapidly in the U.S. And when we look at what are U.S. hospitals doing today about investing, they're investing in outpatient departments, outpatient settings, clinics, same-day surgery centers, freestanding ERs, and micro-hospitals, which are an interesting phenomenon. Now, this isn't that big yet, but these are small, 8 to 12 bed hospitals, uh, smaller in size, certainly, smaller in price. But acute care is rendered in these settings, as is ambulatory and emergency care. 
short stays for low acuity patients. We're seeing big healthcare systems in the US build this type of smaller hospital, micro hospital, in order to get into areas that they normally don't serve, to get closer to patients, and then if those patients do need a higher level of care, to connect them back to the bigger systems. So that's an interesting phenomenon. So we're building, but we're not building anything like we have historically. Um, other places in the states, the Osher, uh, Oshner system in Louisiana, 80% of their future capital spending is being directed at outpatient clinics. Mount Sinai in New York City, their logo and their motto and what they're trying to do now is to care for each patient in the most appropriate setting. So we're still going to have people in acute care hospitals but we're also going to see a lot of care rendered in the patient's home. And interestingly, uh, there are some hospitals we're seeing now doing what would otherwise be hospital-level care in the home for certain patients. Now, obviously, this is not ICU care or highly specialized type of care, but we can recreate the work of a hospital in a patient's home, saving upwards of 30 to 50% of costs, having fewer complications, Healthcare acquired infections in a person's home are a much lower risk than they are in a hospital setting. Lower mortality rates and a high degree of patient satisfaction. So imagine now building, how, how are we building if we're putting this into the equation that some of the care might not be in a hospital at all? You know, there was a time where we used to do in, uh, IV care in hospitals. Uh, I remember that, and then as AIDS evolved and all of those new uh, drugs evolved for people with AIDS, we started doing a lot of IV care, and now it's routine to do that at home. We used to do cataract surgeries inpatient for seven days, and now those are two, three-hour stays in, out, in uh, 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 surgical centers, uh, freestanding surgical centers. So it, it, this is all changing and will continue to change. The other issue around chronic care is for health care, not just the hospitals, but all of us to really appreciate what does a chronically ill patient need. And we go back to what we learned as we, you were in medical school, nursing school, MPH school, the social determinants of health, something that has never been embra embraced by the acute care settings. It really is part of treating people with chronic disease. So is there proper housing, nutrition, a big part of this is behavioral health, people with uh, mental health issues, addiction issues. If we're not taking care of all of those at the same time, we're probably not going to be able to take care of a chronically ill person the way they need to. So this care needs to be coordinated, coordinated and coordinated in the community. And the United States is not a teacher for this. For every $1 we spend on social care, we spend $2 on medical care. If you really want to get to the 5% that drive the 50% of the spending, you need to flip that upside down. $2 for social care, $1 for medical care. And you have to understand these social determinants of care, of health care, of health, to, in order to do that. So we need to inverse these pyramids where, um, the, if you can see this, yes, the industrial age medicine is the pyramid on top, and the digital age medicine is the one on the bottom. And there's a shift not in the power structure, but the roles that we play. As we go into a more digital, technologically-based way of delivering care, the patient has a much bigger role. The physician still has the authority and has a role in all of that, but a lot more involvement from a patient perspective and a lot less of command and con con control from a, a hospital setting for taking care of these patients. So the question that I was asked to address today is, are we overbuilding? And in some places, we still are. Um, and I think that, that we are not really thinking about the hospital inside of a system that helps take care of people with chronic illness. But it depends. I'm not suggesting today that we are not going to continue to have hospitals. But they are looking different. We're starting to see that already. You know, the ICU care, highly specialized care, that's always going to be, for the foreseeable future anyway, of at least the next 20 years inside of a hospital. Now the next 30 or 40 years, as we see more in personalized medicine and genomics, who knows? But there will still be new hospitals being built, but they can't look the way they have for the last 50 years and be meaningful to the patients who need them most who are the chronically ill. So they're going to be here, but we need to really think about adapting the technology that allows us to do the telehealth, that allows us to do scanning, 
Today's paper has a new Apple Watch that's actually going to be able to do an electrocardiogram sitting on your wrist and send that back to the doctor's office. That's in today's newspaper. So that has huge implications for us as we think about building hospitals in the future. I think we need to stop thinking about building hospitals in the future and building health service delivery systems in the future. Thank you very much for listening, and we have five minutes for questions.